All right, just I'll start whenever you tell me to. We're live. All right, uh, welcome to our talk called A Strategic Approach to Custom Migrations. Uh, I'm Adam Zimmerman, software architect here at Chromatic. And Claire, you want to introduce yourself quick? Sure. Hi, I'm Claire, and I am a senior developer with Chromatic. Asaf? Hey, I'm Asaf Katzen. I am as well a senior backend developer at Chromatic. All right, so we'll just dive right in. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, migrations kind of at a higher level, um, strategic approaches to them, but also it's going to assume a little bit of familiarity with uh, some of the technical things. Um, using the Migrate API, which are both um, some PHP and object-oriented concepts, a um, little bit of Drush and module development, and a little bit of configuration management. But hopefully those will kind of be ancillary to the main points we're going to talk through. So first, I'll hand it to Asaf, who's going to talk about the content pyramid. Thank you, Adam. Hey, everyone. When we approach a complex migration, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is how are we going to structure all of this data? One side is how is it structured right now? The other side is how do we want it structured in the new platform? And we're left with the part in between. To make a little bit more sense out of it, all of this, I called it the content pyramid. Adam, can you pass a slide, please? Thanks. So what is content made of? Um, when we think of content, we mostly think about a node um, that the user views on a website. This content, this node, is actually built of many different pieces. Um, it's constructed of structured data. This can be paragraphs, it can be field collections, it might be what we call utility nodes, which are nodes that their only purpose is to enrich a different node. Um, but all of this structured data is part of this node. Below that, we have all of our media, images, files, attachments. These can be actual files that move to our new deployed server and system, or these can also be third-party services that we incorporate into the system as media entities. I'm not going to get into much details about media. Claire is going to give you a very good presentation on that part. Um, and below the media, we're looking about users. In Drupal, almost everything requires a user. Either it's an author, a creator, an owner. We need users. So that's what content is made of. Next slide, please. When we go to migrate it, we need to reverse this pyramid. We need to start from the basics, from the users. If mostly the editors, but it's a good step to move in all of our users. From there, we can build up, go to the files. From files, we build up the media entities. Then we throw in all of the terms, taxonomy terms that we're going to use. It's important to add them at this stage because some of them could use medias and most of them are used by paragraphs and nodes above them. Once we're done with terms, we continue up the ladder, or down the pyramid, um, into our metadata parts, the paragraphs, the field collections, and all of the utility nodes. In some cases, we're going to have dependencies between them as well. So it's important to map these dependencies out and understand what has to come first and how do we layer this data upon each other. Once we have all of this metadata together, we're actually ready to migrate the nodes themselves. And after we migrate the nodes, many times we find ourselves needing to run small scripts to fix attachments or references, to add redirects, metadata, path aliases, all of this stuff that comes at the end when content is actually ready and we can work with it. Next, please. If we look at all of this, we can identify that we're actually looking at four different groups of data. The first group is users. It's a very straightforward group for migrations. Even complex systems in most cases have a rather simple structure for users. Um, and I don't think that needs much explanations. Files and media, again, I don't want to go too deep into those, but since they are a base for all of the content, we really need to take care of them before we continue to the rest. Then we go to the group of metadata, everything that is not directly presented to the user in, in itself, but always presented as part of content. 
So we have to make sure we have all of this ready before we go ahead and migrate the actual content into the system. And that's our four groups of data that we're looking at. Next, please. Okay, but why? Why is it important to look at all of this data and break it into groups and really understand how we're going to approach all of it? So once we break this into independent groups and scripts, it's much easier to model even complex data. Many times the source of this data can come from different sources in very complex migrations. We sometimes have the need to unite data that comes from different databases into a single entity at the end. And once we split up all of this into these groups, we're able to much easier understand how we're going to build the layered structures of all of this. Another important benefit is the easy rollbacks. It can get tempting to write a migration script that will create a node with all of its paragraphs and references and images and everything in one go. Um, but then rolling it back is very difficult. It's extremely difficult to debug it, to understand what's going on and to for example, if we have one error in one field, we suddenly need to roll back the entire node instead of just being able to go in, change what we need, and step back out. And that brings to the other benefit, a layered progression of the actual content. Once we start looking at these groups and building these layers, it's easier for us as developer, as well for all the other stakeholders of a project to understand the data better. And it's a great opportunity to look at it, understand what it's being used for. Many times at this stage, we'll find we can make changes to the structure. Um, we'll find together with clients um, that this is a great opportunity to manipulate data a little bit. And this layered progression allows us to show a development as it goes, see the results, and then work on every little thing on its own. Another huge benefit is, I like to call it the last mile migration. It's very common that in complex migrations, we work with data that is still alive. We can migrate a legacy system, but this system is still being used. There is more data coming in all the time. And although we're working with static data, our migration approach needs to support the continuous integration of this data into the migration. Once we layer and split the migration into many different small scripts, it's much easier to incorporate this updated data into our flow and update our content as it evolves. Until the final migration, which is usually done after a code freeze or a database freeze of a legacy system, then we run this last mile scripts. We don't need to change our scripts. We can continue using them. And maybe the most important part of all of this is that it keeps things simple. Complex data is complex to work with. If we try to model all of it in a single YAML file, it's kind of like trying to put all of your business logic in one function. It helps to, to encapsulate this data, to understand the different layers of it. And then when we look at a wide YAML migration file of a specific field of a node, it's very easy to deal with. So complex data becomes simple once we break it up into these groups, understand the different layers of them, and write very simple scripts for managing this data. Next, please. So how do we get this data? How do we work with complex data and run these migrations? My personal favorite approach is CSV files. I like it for many reasons, but mostly because it's easy for everyone to work with. It doesn't depend on specific software or operating system. It is standard for everybody who work with it. And it's also a format that is usually easy to produce from data, whatever the source is, if it's uh, XMLs originally, if it's databases in different formats. Most systems have an ability to produce the data to CSV file and work from them. That is my favorite. XML will do just as well. And any other format that is supported by Migrate can work. The point is to get this data out of the legacy system and into a static file that we can work with. That's also important because that way we have less dependency on a data source. If you're working against live databases, things change. Uh, 
and we don't know what's going on. It's kind of working with a black box. And when you migrate, you want to see the data that you're working with. So having this on files that we can look at easily that um, helps a lot to understand what it is we're doing. Another important part is the standardization and the pre-processing power. It can be tempting to try to manipulate and process information as part of the migration script. And many times we don't have any other option. We have to do that. But there is a lot of data that we can pre-process before we bring it into the system. If we're having CSV files, we can work with functions. We can do a lot of data manipulation with VLOOKUPs of other data sources. And we can do a lot of work before it even reaches our migration script. So we export all the data to static files. We pre-process them to get them as close as we can to the actual data format that we're going to use. Next, please. And then comes the part of manipulation. We did our best. We tried everything we can using the CSVs, but there is also a limit to the power of uh, Google spreadsheet functions or Excel functions. Um, we cannot uh, do stuff that depends on other entities. We, we're not connected to the system that we're migrating into. So there is a limit to what we can do. We still need to do manipulations on the data. The first step is all of the core plugins from, uh, that come with the Migrate API, and there are many. Um, the link in this slide will take you to a page that will show you all of the core plugins and all of the Migrate Plus plugins. For, uh, for processing data as part of the YAML scripts. And the next piece, but even that sometimes is not enough. We still find ourselves with data that just doesn't fit the way we want it in the system. My best tip on this is using the callback plugin. It's a super simple plugin that allows you to call custom PHP functions. They need to be simple ones, but still it enables you to use a lot of functions on the data as part of the migration script. Sometimes even that is not enough. And that's where we go in and write custom processors. The example that you see here, the append to field is a custom processor that knows how to load a node and add an item to an existing field that might have data into it. That's something that's just not supported by the Migrate API. When we build these custom processors, we keep them generalized, reusable, and we find that many times a few processors can really give you everything you need after using all of the other plugins and callbacks and everything to manipulate the data in the way that you want it and need it to import. Just a few more things about what can we do with this data um, before we go into what is this data. Most of our migrations of complex data will depend on the plugin migration. Basically, it's a lookup that allows us to reference data that has already been migrated as part of the migration script. The most useful function of that is the override properties part. Override properties allows us to tell the migration script to only override specific fields. So if we're coming in and attaching paragraphs to an already existing node, we want to make sure that the only thing we're changing is that specific field for the paragraph. Whenever we use migration scripts to alter existing content or entities, the override properties is what's going to ensure us that we're not corrupting the entire node by updating a single item that actually did much more than what we expected. Which brings me to the next of more and simple is better than less and complex. Simple migration scripts allows easy migration. Again, it's so tempting to try to get that migration done in one go to write that YAML file that will build this complex node with 50 fields and images and references. It can work just as well as writing it in 10 different scripts. But when you have this built in 10 different simple scripts, it's much easier to understand what just happened, to roll back specific parts, to make small changes, and to keep this data much more dynamic than it is when you try to do it all in one go. Another important aspect when we deal with complex data is standardization of date and time formats. I think every single migration I've ever done included custom dates and time formats. That's an integral part of every system especially systems that end up being migrated. Um, that's the base of data. 
it's a tremendous value to be able to standardize all of this before it even reaches the system. My personal favorite, Unix timestamps, convert from that to whatever you want when you migrate inside, if it's a date only or a date time, but if you're able to get all of your dates and times into Unix timestamps, it saves a lot of headaches. And while you're at it, try to standardize everything. Once you take out content from a system and put it in a file, many times you find patterns that you can fix. Many times the owner of the data understands it better and understands the relations better and is able to standardize things even more. That's the greatest opportunity to do it. Once the data is out of the system and before you're processing it, is a great time to standardize everything. And just one last part about multilingual migrations. So multilingual migrations are no different, but they do require that you plan well ahead. That's the same as building a multilingual Drupal website. There is nothing inherently different about it, but if you don't plan for it well ahead and understand where you want to take it, um, it's gonna be a headache and content migration is no different. Drupal migration supports the concept of an original translation source. It understands how to add more content as translations of that. And if you build your content pyramid in a, in a layered structure of dependencies, you just need to make sure that your original source language is inserted before any other translations and everything is the same. That's it for me on a high level, how to look at your content. And do I pass it to Claire? Thanks, Asaf. Um, so in this next portion of the presentation, I wanted to zero in on some common use cases, um, the enormity of this topic and the constraint of our time, given that um, I sort of had to pick and choose. So this is more of a tactical um, on the ground approach to dealing with uh, complex data structures such as media entities, um, and then um, how to process uh, some of your source data coming into your target application. Next slide. So uh, in the context of these two topics, um, I wanted to touch on, uh, with respect to migrating media entities, um, just talk about like different um, source uh, scenarios. The first being maybe you're um, coming from an, a, uh, an earlier version of Drupal 8 or Drupal 7 instance, um, working with file um, image file upload fields. So how to approach um, transforming those into uh, media entities. Then also talk about data coming from non-Drupal data stores um, and specifically how to deal with uh, inline embedded media references in your source system and how to bring those over. Um, sorry, can you go back a little bit? <laughs> sorry. Um, and then uh, lastly, just an option for how to uh, deal with um, this if you have maybe a, a simpler site um, and you don't maybe need the Migrate API to do this. And then lastly, just a, a few words on how to merge multiple source fields into a single entity as that is also a common scenario that you might encounter. Um, next slide. So uh, just a quick word about media in core. Um, it's been in core since 8.4. Um, and as most of us are probably familiar with, it's a really robust framework for media management, um, whether it's native media or coming from a third party. Uh, it's highly extensible. There's a rich um, ecosystem of contrib modules that support media in core. And of course, the objects that we're talking about are images, PDFs, um, so social media embeds and the like. Um, and the main takeaway is that media entities um, are standardized, uh, full-fledged, fieldable entities. They make entity references to file entities and they themselves can be um, the object of entity reference fields from other node types. Next slide. So when you um, first start approaching how to migrate media, the advice across the board, um, and Asaf mentioned this too, is that you need to migrate your files first, and then once you do that, generate the media entities. Next slide. So uh, the first order of business is to get all your source files into uh, the managed file system. And you can do that with um, a handy ready to go destination plugin called entity file. So here's a sample um, migration YAML file for a file migration, um, and that will get all your files into Drupal. Next slide. 
Um, and the second part of this process is then once you have your file entities ingested and imported, you can create your media entities out of them. So there is also a ready to go destination plugin called Entity Media that will do this for you. And as part of that process, um, you need to do a migration lookup on the files migration that, would, that just occurred to make that link or that reference between the media entity and the file entity. So that in summation is just the general process for getting uh, media entities into a, a Drupal system. Next slide. Um, so in the first uh, use case um, that I mentioned, the context that I wanted to talk about was say um, you have a Drupal 7 install or even an earlier version of Drupal 8 prior to when media got into core and you're trying to figure out how to get all your file entities or your previous file fields um, into media entities. Um, in the course of doing research for this presentation, I came across two contrib modules um, that try to automate this process and, and really um, provide a way to do this process efficiently. Um, so the two I wanted to mention are media migration and migrate file to media. Um, there are some nuances between them, but I'll just touch on them lightly to talk about how you can use them. Next slide. So media migration um, is a control project um, actually developed by our friends over at Lullabot. Um, it provides a migration pathway for media between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And um, one nuance about this that I thought, think is really interesting is that it actually can also transform all your uh, media WYSIWYG tokens into proper entity embeds um, in Drupal. So what, it, what this does is it takes, it basically leverages Drush commands to automate these processes. So you can run Drush migrate upgrade, pass in uh, the key uh, for the legacy database, as well as um, the file system root of the legacy system with the configure only flag and you can export this configuration and then run your uh, configuration and content migrations. Next slide. Uh, so the, the first uh, command here, the result of this, of importing um, the uh, configuration entities will take care of actually um, taking whatever fields are attached to your Drupal 7 um, or Drupal 8 uh, uh, fields and attach them to the target bundle. Um, and then once you have that configuration migration done, you can actually import uh, those media entities using the content tag flag. Um, and that will take care of importing your entities as well. Next slide. Um, the other contrib project that I want to mention um, that a lot of people seem to have a success with is Migrate File to Media. Um, next slide. It also leverages Drush commands um, to automate uh, these processes. So you can run um, this Drush command, Drush Migrate File Media Fields, pass in the entity type, the bundle, the source field, the target media bundle, and it will generate your target media fields just by running this Drush command, which is very cool. Next slide. Um, and it also enables you to generate your migration YAML files um, just by running this command. Um, and when you do that, next slide, it will launch a generator. Um, as a preface to this, do you want to make sure you have um, a custom module set up already scaffolded? Um, when you are writing migration scripts, you need a place to put them in your code. Um, so you we often package them in a custom module. And so this generator will just walk you through some basic questions like what's the machine name of your custom module? What's your source field? What's your target bundle? And it will actually generate your migration YAML files and save them to the config install directory of the custom module that you specify. Next slide. Um, one cool feature about this contrib project is that it does uh, duplicate file detection. So by just running this migrate command with the migration ID of the images or files uh, migration that you have going, it will create a binary hash of that file, store that in a table in the database, and then, um, as a, and again, you need to do this before you actually run your media import. But when you go ahead and run your media migration, it will double check um, against that table and it will not import if it already exists. Um, next slide. So that covers sort of a quick and dirty if you have uh, your source is a Drupal application. Um, but oftentimes uh, doing migrations, we're pulling in a data from a non Drupal data store. 
Um, and one common use case scenario that I wanted to um, uh, uh, address is say you have a WordPress article that you want to move into Drupal. And in the legacy system, maybe editors have been adding inline image tags or um, social media embeds. And so all those, you know, how do we approach taking, migrating those articles um, with all these inline media references into Drupal? Um, so the approach is, you know, you're you're the, you're going to be using the same source as the in attached entity, and in our case, in our example of a WordPress article, um, it's the body field of that article, and we need to parse that uh, body data, um, and we can do that by creating a custom process plugin, um, and in that we can use regular expressions to identify and target those inline references. Um, and then do some process them to ultimately swap them out with whatever proper entity embed code you want in the destination um, article body field. So you can write custom methods to do the file lookups, generate the entities, and then ultimately create the embed market that you want to replace for that article body value. Next slide. So here's an example from a article um, uh, from an article migration YAML file where we're taking the body value of that article and passing it through some um, process plugins. Um, notably, the one we want to look at is a custom process plugin that we wrote called Entity Embed. Next slide. And in here, you can see um, in the transform method, there are two regular expressions that are looking for matches, right? So in the first case, we're looking for image short codes with IDs. In the second case, we're looking for social media embeds and tags. And so if there is a string match, it will pass that as a parameter to further processing methods, um, convert image markup and convert media respectively. And we'll take a look, quick look inside of those. Um, next slide. Uh, in convert Im image markup, if there's a match with a short code with an ID, it will look do a lookup on that ID, see if that media entity exists, and if it does, extract its UUID by loading the media entity and then passing that as a parameter to the final method that will actually generate the embed markup. Next slide. And in the case of social media embeds, um, the convert media method will also run a regular expression to extract the URL. It'll check and to see if it exists and then determine the type of media. The three that we're concerned about here are YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And if we have the URL and type, we can pass that to a final a method uh, to actually generate the media embed markup. Next slide. And what those do ultimately is return the actual embedded entities. So here we have the actual legit markup um, that we will replace in the article body of the former inline references with um, the HTML embed codes on the destination side for those article body values. Next slide. Um, so if the third contest I wanted to uh, also mention in terms of um, dealing with migrating entities is maybe you have a site or an application um, and it feels a little bit heavy handed to have to do all the um, work with migration modules. Um, I'm making a shameless plug to Adam who wrote this article um, a while back about how to do that uh, without Migrate API. Um, so I highly encourage anyone, if this matches your use case, to go, <clears throat> excuse me, check that out. Um, it basically recommends using hook updates to generate media entities and then to delete um, those file fields subsequently. Next slide. Um, and then it, lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, how to deal with uh, multiple source fields. Um, this is a common scenario where when you're doing migrations, it's often um, an opportunity to streamline and update your content model, um, consolidate objects um, that were maybe all over the place in the system, in the legacy system. And we want to bring those all into a single entity in the, in the target system. Um, so you can do that. Um, you just have to make sure you choose your primary source wisely. Um, and then you can write a custom source plugin to extract further data from other uh, places in your data store and set those as additional source properties in the plugin. Next slide. 
So here's an example of a custom source plugin of an article where um, inside the prepare row method, um, you can run multiple queries to set your source properties. So in this case, we want to find other taxonomy terms that might be added to this article or other attachments. Um, we also want to set the author and set the meta tags for this article. So you can see inside here in the, on the row, there's a set source property that allows you to do this. And so you can set the actual property and then the, derive that value from whatever the results of your query are. And now that will be available in your migration YAML file. Next slide. Um, here's another example. Um, this is again, another um, from an example from an article that Lullabot wrote about merging entities. Um, in this instance, the context for this is that it's overriding a, a custom uh, or the default taxonomy plugin. Um, and merging another entity's fields with it. So running a query, um, joining on the term ID, and if there's a match, it will take the fields of the uh, entity, uh, which is not being migrated, it's being um, added to the term migration, and it will set the source property of that entity's fields and um, with this get fields values property or method, um, apply the values for that as well. So I know that was a lot of information for a short period amount of time, but that's uh, you know some approaches that we can take for doing dealing with complex data structures and requirements. And with that, I'll pass it over to Adam, who's going to talk about um, how to debug and troubleshoot migrations effectively. Thanks, Claire. Uh, yeah. So now that we've written our migrations, invariably there will be problems, right? Um, so we're going to talk about some tricks to uh, get them to run faster and understand what's happening. Uh, so first, there's, the, there's this cool migrate status module. Uh, many times in your you know, code, you have entity hooks, um, and you might not want all those to run during a migration. Um, for example, you might be generating that field values from other field values, and you might not need to do that because the migration does that for you. Um, or maybe you're making an API call on an entity save, and you don't want to make you know, a couple thousand uh, API calls within a couple seconds and blow up your API limit. Um, so this is a clean way to just detect if a migration is running and adjust to that in your entity hooks. So a nice, simple utility module. Uh, limits. This is another great tool when you're writing a migration. Um, you might only need to do one or two uh, to prove out your theory to see if your migration is going to work. And that's great. You can use this flag. Um, but it should be known that this does not actually apply a limit uh, to your source query. So if you're using SQL, uh, there is no limit on that query. It's still uh, grabbing all those rows, and it still calls prepare row on every single source record. So if you have uh, subsequent queries in prepare row, like Claire was just talking about, um, those are all still going to run even if you have limit one. Um, so that can quickly cause it to slow down, or in some cases, just cause the, migrate, the query to not even be runnable, um, as it's just simply trying to do too much. So how do you get around that? Um, if you're doing a SQL migration, um, hidden in the source class, it's not really hidden, because that's the beauty of open source. Um, you can go see exactly um, how it's working, uh, and you know, understand what's going on, and also you know, make changes to it, too. Um, submit backs and patches. Um, so you can adjust your batch size, um, whether that's through your source plugin definition in the, your migration YAML file, or just setting it as a property in your source plugin class if you're using a custom plugin. Um, so you can set this to whatever value you want, and then it puts a limit on your query and allows it to run or run a lot more quickly. Uh, some other options, uh, there's all sorts of ways to define how joins are done uh, in the query, um, set your database target. Um, there's all sorts of stuff you can do here. It's just cool to go exploring in the source classes of the migration module and understand what it does and what all your options are. Sometimes it's, uh, it's a bit opaque when you're just in a YAML file um, trying to figure out what to put there and looking at examples online. So next, migration speed. I'm sure we've all written migrations and tested them with a few items and thought we were good to go. And then we try to run the whole thing and uh, realize things are not working as intended. Um, and I've found that 
the first, when you start a migration, items go a lot more quickly. Uh, and then as it keeps going, um, the speed will slow down considerably. And eventually, sometimes they'll crash and uh, doesn't fully reclaim the memory usage like it's claiming to do. And there are issues on Drupal.org about this, but I don't believe they're solved yet. So in the interim, we have some tricks. Um, so it should be known that I originally found this trick from a media current article, and then I used it and wrote my own article, and then someone else even took that and ran with it even more. Um, so the trick is you run drush migrate import with that limit flag, and possibly if with the batch size too, you can combine both of those together, and then you just keep calling it in a loop in a shell script with a low limit value. And that keeps your average item processing time much lower and allows the migration to finish without having memory issues. So this gist that's linked here kind of, well, it shows the script that we used. Um, it's not ideal because, you know, it's a brittle shell script, but um, sometimes that's what it takes to get the migration done. And it's also nice because you can have the migration um, sequence and ordering, like Asaf was talking about, um, committed in a shell script in your repo. So, there are benefits to this too, even if you don't do a loop. So this is the subs, the guy that uh, took up what I, this script idea and expanded upon it even more. Um, he wrote migrate import batch that does all that magic of that shell script and combines it hidden into this command, which is really nice. Um, it does seem to only work with CSV files as he actually splits out the file and makes separate ones. Um, but this is pretty cool that you can just pass it this and then in the background it does everything it needs to do to run the migration without having memory issues. Uh, migrate DVAL. This is a fantastic module um, that actually worked a long time ago and only recently began working with Drush 9 as of June 12th. Um, the patch just got committed so that's great. Um, you can have the migrate debug and migrate debug pre um, to you pass that to the migrate import and it spits out exactly what's coming in and what's going out. And it's a great tool to help you understand um, what's happening as sometimes it can be very opaque. Um, you know, you might run a migration with 10 items and everything works and then you run it for 50 and you run into some bad data and you're like, well, why didn't this work? It was working on the other 10. Um, so this helps you see what's coming in and what's going out and uh, you know, adjust your processing to be as robust as needed to solve everything. Uh, you know, this is also when you can you know, easily see those timestamps and dates and get those all um, cleared up like uh, Asaf was talking about. Uh, and there's all sorts of great uh, resources on this. Um, there's stuff on Drupal.org. There's stuff for the talks about uh, how to use the callback plugin with var dump. Um, kind of as Asaf was also talking about using that, the callback plugin. It's a simple one to just call any PHP function. So of course you can call var dump. Um, and then you know you can use xdebug with some of some of these posts to talk you through that. Um, all sorts of tips and tricks that I encourage you guys to check out some of these articles um, as there's just you know too much to cover in this short time. So with that I will open up the floor to questions. Anyone have any questions? What's still missing from the tooling? Like, what are the, um, what sort of items or types of problems do you still regularly run into? Um, I think a, a good way to solve the memory issues without resorting to custom, uh, you know, using this, these limits and kind of hacky things. Um, for like a SQL based migration would be great. Um, Clara Soff, any thoughts from you on that? In, in terms of the tooling for debugging, is that? Uh, just in general, what, what could make, I think Mark's question is generic, just anything that would make the whole migration process better. I mean, again, there's a lot out there um, in contrib um, that's making a lot of headway, you know, to 
automate some of these processes, um, like in the specifically with the media entities, you know, some of these modules that are coming out like only in the earlier this year or last year um, to uh, try to make it more efficient so that you're not writing migration scripts. From, um, and I think all of them, um, you know, it's hard to cover every use case, right? But for, uh, for stuff where, you know, you have straightforward entities that need to come over, um, but that are not handled by um, either migrate upgrade or some of these other ones. I think there's just a lot out there that are try trying to solve this problem. Um, but I think, again, like every migration is custom. So there's, there's always going to be things that you might have to write custom code with. So I think the tools are getting better. And I think there's more coming out every day um, to try to automate some of this stuff. Um, and they're looking really promising. Um, but I'm trying to think of like ones off the top of my head that, you know, sort of cover most things, but then, you know, maybe don't cover some edge cases. I, I think about that for a minute. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, uh, I did most of the migrations I did a couple of years ago. And I know just recently there's, I've seen so many cool modules that make um, very difficult things a lot easier. Um, they wrote some of the plugins that I wrote, um, but they, you know, took them to the next level and expanded on them. Um, so it's cool to, you know, if you're struggling with something, I'd encourage everyone to just look, uh, look out at Contrib because there's some really great tools out there to aid in the migration process. With regard to the limit command, not actually limiting things on the source, mm -hmm. um, that's been the case for a long time, I feel like. Is that, would you consider that a bug or a feature at this point, or just something that's not able to be resolved? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing there's a good reason, maybe, that it is the way it is, because sometimes you, do you need to, sometimes you might need to gather all of the source records to um, do, do something. I, I can't try to remember the use case I had for this one time, but you had to like get everything loaded up to do, and then check things against each other for like a remapping of taxonomy terms or something I did in a migration once. So, um, I don't know. Could it be that if you're like not importing an entire set and you need to filter somehow, you can't just grab 10 if maybe the result out of those 10 would be zero. Like you have to grab the whole thing and then prepare the rows. I'm guessing yeah. maybe it's something related to that. So yeah, I mean, just as long as you know, uh, you're aware of it, I think that's the, you know, the important thing and you know, if you want it, you could always write, you know, your own uh, SQL based plugin that reacted to that flag differently and, you know, did respect it in some way. So that's the, the beauty of open source. So sounds like we're going to say it's a feature. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm sticking to because I don't know why the first, you know, whoever built it did it that way. So any other questions? Clear us off any last uh, words of wisdom? All right. Will you, well, be able to, will you be able to add the links that you shared? Uh, can we add those to the video description for folks that might see this later? Sure, we can get those added. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll get all these links added to the video description and hopefully this helps you in your next migration. Have a good one.